First things first, if you haven't seen part one, I'd kindly suggest you go watch that now. This is a follow-up. Spoiler alert, my first attempt at this, that part one video, was a resounding failure. Though this one isn't really all that, I can totally live with that failure. Lock it out emotionally and move on like nothing happened. Quite easily, in fact, I sleep like a baby. The only time I even give these lampshades a second thought is when I've got to move them out of my way to get something else. However, and the reason I've gathered you all here today, in that fleeting moment of exploratory wonder, after publishing that video despite these results, I received hundreds of brilliant suggestions on how one might make this work. After that video, I went out and I bought this. And this, my digital friends, is 99.9% .9 pure aluminum. Do you have any idea how hard that is to find on the street, uncut? I have had this laying around since, I don't know, midsummer, taunting me. But today is a new day, and I think I owe it to you to try this again. That, and I still have an end game if this actually works. Give me just one moment to prep a blank. Quick recap, the buck or the form was cut on the CNC router. This shape is perfectly parabolic, or as close as I could get, with the focal point about an inch inside of this on center line. That might be more important later if this actually works, but for now there's a form I'm trying to get the sheet metal to. The finished formed part will have a large hole in the back, about an inch in diameter, and I'm taking advantage of that here. I'm using a dowel pin in the buck in the form and capturing my work onto that. I have an additional part, fits the dowel pin on one side and a live center on the back. That pressure from the tailstock, squeezing the blank onto the form, is what drives the work. It's what spins this disc. I'm doing that because I'm a scaredy cat. This whole spinning thing is pushing the level of comfort I have with my lathe. And again, since I need a hole in the center anyway, I don't know, might as well pin this spinning saw blade of death down in place. As some of you noticed in the first video, my tooling is a little bit different. Like any good YouTuber trying to make you think they know what they're doing, I sat down and watched some videos beforehand. Did some homework as it were, before part one. Now of the two videos I watched, the roller style really spoke to me, as opposed to like the blunt wood turners sort of freestyle spoon or whatever they call them. Although I did start out with one of those. I made this for the last video before I switched to the bearing, but found it a little harder to use, though I might have made it a little too short. For the sake of science, and since this is a different material, I may make another one and try it again. Alright, still not great, but this is far and away a lot better than what I was getting with the other material. There's still a little bit of that crumpling going on, that buckling, lampshading. Though I think that's because I just didn't work this area enough, or as much as this area. I don't think I was feeling this under the tool as it was spinning. I didn't even notice it after it stopped until I'm holding it here in the light. I must have just gotten excited that I made it this far and decided to part it off. The center is still trying to break free. I can only assume it's because I'm pinching this material at some point, but I don't know. Still a bit of a reverse bend I can't quite explain. I must be pushing material in towards the center accidentally. But that's a lot better. The finish on the inside leaves a lot to be desired, but let's try this again with the blunt tool.
one more time. I'm using paste wax now and I've taken off my tool post. You happen to be familiar with the old saying, there are two types of knowledge. Would you just have a look at the arrogance? Not only is it perfectly spun, they've even rolled a bead on the edge. Just makes my blood boil. Okay, so here's the thing. You just love that opener. You always know something good's coming when you hear that. Here's the thing. I'm all for learning a new skill, but I've got some stuff working against me here. First, there's the whole not knowing what I'm doing thing, though that's rarely stopped me before. Second, I'm starting to wonder if this is even possible on a metal turning lathe. I mean, if it were, why would there be metal spinning lathes? And finally, and this is probably the biggest one, I'm just throwing away perfectly good raw material and not learning anything really fast. And I want to make a thing. There's something I wanted to do with these shapes. Let's talk about what that is. Hold on a second. Let's first do a little lessons learned kind of a thing. These parts, even the earliest one, I mean, it's not as big as I wanted, but even the earliest one would work for what I'm trying to do. I really would have liked a much better surface finish or perhaps even an out, some way to polish the inside of this, but I have no idea how I'd even hold these parts to do that. And for me personally, the bearing tool, the bearing on the stick that you saw, was a lot easier to control than the blunt stick. But the blunt stick was giving me a lot better surface finish than the bearing. You know, I, I got some galling here. That's probably more technique and, yeah, probably technique. The business end was pretty polished. I don't think I had any weird, you know, scratches or bumps that would cause that kind of a galling. Probably just inconsistent pressure on my part. But you can see on the inside, it's wrapping to the form quite well as opposed to this one, which has just got all these weird and crazy lines in it. I mean, in some spots, I think I can even detect the wood grain of the buck that I was forming this against. Could I get to something like this? Maybe. That would cost me a ton more in time and material. Then I think I'm really willing to sink into this. This is a Godox AD200. It's a camera flash, the kind you put on top of your camera to take pictures. It's just like this one with the only difference that I love this one more. And this one, the AD200, doesn't need to be on a camera. It's wireless. In fact, I don't think you'd ever really even want to mount it on a camera. Technically, this one is too, or can be. But the Nikon is optical, like optical wireless. And the Godox is radio triggered. What that means is I can hide this one behind a wall and it would still fire when I hit my shutter button. But the Nikon might not, if it's not in the infrared line of sight of the camera or if it's too far away. Like when you're taking pictures at the beach. You want to stay out of sight, right? Not get arrested again. This one's better for that. This flash can overpower the noonday sun. And compared to name brand flashes, feature for feature, I think blows them all out of the water. If you're looking for a radio flash, I highly suggest checking this one out. No affiliation, of course, I just like it. These details aren't important here, but I wanted you to know what we're looking at. This thing comes with two heads. The flash head you've been staring at, which I never use, and a bulb, which is awesome. Does the same thing, you hit the shutter button, gives off a big burst of light. Except with this head, you can hold it up in one hand like the Statue of Liberty and make pretend you're an old-timey photographer. You can buy accessories that mount around this light to modify it, to modify what the light is doing. And my favorite is the reflector. The math's starting that up yet? The accessories go on with this bayonet mount. So this thing works pretty well, but I've always wanted a larger one. I don't have things like soft boxes or anything like that, and I prefer to stay as mobile as possible. So this was meant to be the bigger brother to this, but since all signs point to me spending four grand in raw aluminum before I get even close, I'm drawing a line in the sand and modifying one of these. Now, this is probably not really parabolic. Though of the ones I've seen, it looks pretty darn close, doesn't it? And in the end, it's probably not all that important anyway. In order to mount this, I've got to put a hole in the back and attach this bayonet mount. I made this off camera. I do have footage of that. I'll weld these together. We'll make a diffuser and test this thing out. 
Before we get to that though, I have a very brief but unrelated announcement. I know, I know. Shut up and get back to work. Let's head over to the lathe. I'd like to put an inch and a half diameter hole in the back of this bowl, somewhere around 40 millimeters. I'm in the three jaw chuck with the external jaws and setups like this are always precarious. A flimsy part like this is gonna look for any excuse to just jump out and bite you. This coincidentally is where six jaw chucks would really shine. I'm gonna try a hole saw, this is a high speed steel hole saw. I'm gonna pre-drill a little bit undersize of the pre-drill that's in the hole saw. I wanna minimize any tendency at all for a drill to pull this out of my chuck. I also, of course, will be keeping my fingers crossed. Now a hole saw is gonna have a lot of contact pressure, a lot of cutting pressure. There's a lot of teeth there at the same time, as opposed to using something like the point of a boring bar or some kind of a face grooving tool that probably has less cutting pressure and is only on one point. But I'm hoping maybe this is more balance. More cutting pressure, but maybe more balanced loads on the part. The smart thing to do would probably put this on the mill with toe clamps all around the rolled flange and hole saw it from the top. And I just know if I would have just gone ahead and drilled this, it would have worked fine, but because I'm making a big stink of it, my odds of things going south have just gone north. That went off the rails fast. This loosened up on me on the rotary table and it got way hotter than I was expecting. Sometimes you got it and sometimes you don't. I was worried I burnt through. There's a couple of spots in there. I don't know if you can make those out, but boy, that was a car wreck. It doesn't really matter, of course, but I think I'm just gonna wash this bead over. It's a pride thing at this point. I don't know if I wanna be staring at that every time I pick up this reflector. And that, my friends, is how we hide our shame. It did actually sink a little bit. Check that out. I did plan to paint this black, match this one. I don't have any aluminum primer, but this should work just fine as is. The inside is still okay. I didn't melt through. Let's give it a try. Seems pretty good. Next up, I'm gonna cut out a diffuser. I don't really have a clever way to attach this just yet. I may not always want this on there, so it'd be nice to be able to easily remove it. I'm thinking those little spring clips, the little binder clips, a couple of them should probably do it. Anyway, let's try it out. <laughs> 